Thank you, Dr. Hans. Um, you mentioned Fluor, and, and uh, if we haven't introduced her yet, so I just want to speak briefly. Uh, uh, Fluor Dykersh um, is last year intern at Clinical Genetics AMC Hospital in Amsterdam with a PhD in epigenetics and neuroblastoma. She has an interest in Wiedemann Steiner syndrome since 2015 and started outpatient clinic for WSS patients um, January of this year. So thank you for your presence here today as well. Uh, now our next uh, speaker is Dr. Wendy Jones, who works in general cl uh, cl clinical genetics. She has a specialist interest in genomics, chromatin disorders, uh, including Wiedemann Steiner, and disorders associated with hypertrichosis. Um, Dr. Jones received her MBBS from University College in London, and after completing core medical training in London, she undertook her training in clinical genetics at St. George's Hospital in London and Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children. During her training, Dr. Jones carried out research at the University of Cambridge, uh, based at the uh, Welcome Trust Sanger Institute. She researched Wiedemann Steiner syndrome and disorders associated with uh, hypertrichosis. And in addition, Dr. Jones carried out some of the core genomic analysis for the Deciphering Developmental Disorder Study, which is a nationwide study into developmental disorders. So um, we, again, appreciate your presence and your assistance, and um, come on up. Great, thanks Chris. Um, so it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Thank you everyone for coming and thank you everyone for joining us um, online. Um, so I'm excited today to present to you um, some of my research that many of you have participated in. Um, but I'm also going to start with sort of a basic introduction. So sorry if it's a bit of repetition, but I'm going to go right away back to basics. So hopefully we'll kind of help you kind of get through the kind of the basic science too. So do I have to press this to go on? Is that printer? Ah. Okay, so right the way back to the beginning. Um, so why is it called Wiedemann-Steiner syndrome? So like many um, medical or genetic disorders, it's actually named after two doctors. And it's named after the two doctors who first described um, individuals who had sort of certain characteristics. Um, so in the past, before we did genetic testing, many doctors um, had experience of seeing patients in clinic and trying to, so I guess, describe their features so that other doctors in the future could say, oh, actually, I think I've got a patient like the same as that, that doctor's patient. Um, and then in the future, hopefully, to find what, what the cause is. Um, so Wiedemann um, was a very famous German pediatrician who described a number of different um, disorders and he wrote a big atlas of clinical sort of genetic syndromes. Um, and so the little boy on the left-hand side is little boy who Wiedemann described um, who had short stature. Um, and he thought he had a characteristic facial appearance. Um, and then later in Brazil, a German doctor called Dr. Steiner, who was working out in Brazil, um, um, saw this little girl in clinic who, he, who he thought had similar features to Wiedemann's little, little boy. And so they both wrote reports. Um, Wiedemann wrote a report in a textbook, um, and Steiner wrote a report in the literature. Um, and so the, the, the children, I guess, with these features, that's, that, that's where it sort of comes from, Wiedemann and Steiner. And the word syndrome just basically comes from a Greek word meaning to run together. So it just means that features that are seen together in a particular disorder. So that's the first, the first two individuals at the top there. Um, and then some German clinical geneticists um, saw three um, individuals in, in their clinic who they thought had similar features to the features of Wiedemann and Steiner's um, patients. And so they published a paper, I think, in 2010 um, where they, they said that we've got these three individuals um, who have similar features to these the other patients. And so we're going to call it after these doctors and we're going to call it Wiedemann Steiner syndrome. Um, but at this point, none of these children have had genetic testing. So this is basically based on sort of someone examining them and thinking that we've got the features that, that are similar. And um, so none of these children had had at this point genetic testing. Um, so, what are the features? So, um, Wiedemann Steiner syndrome is associated with a range of features. And I'll come back on to, to, I guess, the latest findings from my research towards the end of this talk. Um, but I guess it's important to remember that not everyone with Wiedemann Steiner syndrome will have all of the features. Um, and also, if an individual has a certain feature, it won't necessarily be to the same degree or the same severity as other individuals with that same feature. Um, and I guess 
we might be learning more and more about the dinosaurs, and I guess in the future, in the future, we'll know a lot more about it. So, obviously, in the literature, we had patients from Vida and Steiner and Koenig in Germany, um, but actually, until 2012, nobody knew what the cause was. Um, and in 2011, I saw a little boy in clinic who had um, increased body hair and he had a short stature um, and delay in his development. Um, and around the same time, one of my colleagues was seeing a family in clinic with a little boy with similar features. Um, and we felt that these two children didn't have um, a disorder that we knew about, um, but um, 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 so we, we set about a research project to try and find out the, the cause of, of these children's difficulties. Um, and so what we did is we did something called whole exome sequencing. Um, can you hear me still at like that? Well, yeah. It's Am a bit... combination between what can be heard here and what can be heard uh, Okay. Am I too close to the microphone as well? It's difficult to know. That's that better? Yeah. yeah? Okay. So um, so I guess so basically we had we had two, two children who we'd seen in clinic and we wanted to find out what was wrong with them. Um, and so we, we did a test called whole exome sequencing. So this is a test where we look across all the genes. It's a very broad test. Um, and we, we, with these two children, we, we found three other children who had similar difficulties to these two children. Um, and we found uh, um, that, that four of these children had an alteration or a mutation. So I guess people use the word mutation, variant, alteration, but it means the same thing, essentially a spelling mistake in the same gene. Um, so essentially we found the cause for, for Wiedemann and Steiner syndrome back in 2012. Um, so I'm going to go right the way back to basics. So what are genes? Um, so genes essentially give the body instructions how to grow and develop and function. Um, and we've got around 20,000 genes um, and found in most of the cells of our body. Um, and they all come in pairs. And so we inherit one gene of each pair from each of our parents. When we have children, we pass on just one copy of each gene onto each of our children. So genes give our boys instructions how to grow, develop, and function, and they're found in virtually all the cells of the body. And that's at the bottom there is a little cartoon of a gene. Um, so genes consist of DNA, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about them in a minute. So you can see there we've got the gene on the top right-hand side, um, and so that's the gene giving the body an instruction to make a protein. Um, and genes, I guess, consist of strands of DNA. And we've, got, we've got long strands of DNA which consist of the genes and the bits between the genes. And all this DNA is wound up into tight bundles called chromosomes to sort of make it tidy and stored in the nucleus of a control center of the cell. So we've talked about genes and what they are and how they give the body instructions, how um, they give the body instructions to make a protein, how they're wound up into bundles called chromosomes and they're stored in the control center of virtually all of our cells. So that's that's it. In the old days, we used to look, look down the microscope at chromosomes, and that's what they look like. So you can see, like our genes, all our chromosomes come in come in pairs. Um, and this is a man because he's got he's got 23 pairs of chromosomes, and cr chromosome pen 23 are an X and a Y chromosome. So these the first 22 pairs of the chromosomes are the same in men and women. Um, and in addition, men have an X and a Y chromosome and women have two X chromosomes. So why is this important? Um, so, um, going. so and it's just really, this is just really to highlight, because sometimes get asked this, that the KMT2A gene, so the gene that you have, if you have an alteration in it, you have Wiedemann and Steiner syndrome, is on chromosome 11. So we have um, two copies of chromosome 11, um, and so you have two copies of the KMT2A gene, um, and having an alteration in just one, or a mutation, or um, whatever you call it, in just one copy of the KMT2A gene causes you to have Eden and Steiner syndrome. But this is, on the, this is on the chromosome that men and women both have two of, so there's no sort of difference in terms of um, men or women having it. So very roughly, that each of the genes in our body gives instructions to make a single protein. Um, so you probably know about lots of other proteins in the body. So we've got, we've got lots and lots of proteins, obviously, the sort of building blocks of our bodies. Um, so proteins include collagen or hemoglobin. Um, and so the KMT2A gene gives the body instructions to make a protein called, also called KMT2A. Um, and you'll, you'll probably, if you're, I guess, can look at look at text closely or you look at research articles closely, we use italics when we're talking about a gene and we don't use italics when we're talking about a protein. So if you're ever reading any sort of complex science, if it's 
If it's a metallic, they're talking about the gene. If it's not, they're talking about the protein. So the KMT2A gene gives the body instruction to make the KMT2A protein. Um, and so Hans has beautifully talked about this as well, but I guess just sort of a recap. Um, so actually the, the KMT2A protein is actually an enzyme. So what are enzymes? Um, so enzymes are biological molecules typically proteins that significantly speed up the rate of virtually all of the chemical reactions that take place within our cells. Um, so there's lots and lots of different enzymes doing lots of different things. And enzymes are sort of vital for life and they serve in lots of very essential processes. Um, some enzymes break large molecules up into smaller molecules. Some enzymes build up smaller molecules into larger molecules. Um, but generally, enzymes are very specific and they sort of act on one, generally act on one reaction. So when thinking about KMT2A, um, we know that it's a gene that gives the body instructions to make a protein called KMT2A, and we know that this protein is an enzyme, so it's involved in um, speeding up the rate of a chemical reaction in the body. So this is where it gets a bit complicated. Um, so the KMT2A protein is an enzyme, and it catalyzes a reaction that involves the DNA itself. So obviously we have enzymes that break down food in our mouths or in our stomach, um, but actually the KMT2A enzyme, and this is why it's, I guess, so hard to understand, actually catalyzes a reaction that involves the way the DNA is sort of wound up itself. Um, so I guess so very broadly, um, what it does is either tells the DNA to be open, so less tightly wound up, or closed, be more tightly wound up. Um, and that, that is because it catalyzes a reaction on these histones that um, Hans is talking about, um, which enables this to happen. So if you remember from, when I talked about where the gene is, we talked about this diagram here. Um, and now we're sort of, it's sort of a meta, talking about it again, but in a different way. So I guess this, this is a gene and this is telling the body to make a protein. Whereas what happens with KMT2A, you've got the KMT2A gene, it's making instructions, telling the body to make KMT2A protein. And then what this protein is doing is acting back again on this wound up DNA and telling it to be more open or be more closed. So it's, so it's an enzyme, but it's, it's complicated because it actually then goes back and acts on the DNA itself. So summary. Um, so KMT2A gene gives the body instructions to make a protein called KMT2A. The KMT2A protein is an enzyme. The KMT2 enzyme tells DNA to be open, be less tightly wound up, or closed, be more tightly wound up, by catalyzing reaction on the protein that DNA wraps around. So having an alteration in one copy of the KMT2A gene affects the manufacture of a number of proteins in the body, and this is what causes the effect, or most likely causes the effect of the human sinus syndrome. So if you can imagine, if you're telling the DNA to be more open or more closed, that's going to affect what other proteins are made. So remember when, when I talked about um, just go back if I can. Um, if, the, if the DNA is very wound up, it means you can't do this. You can't say make this protein because actually all of all of other proteins and chemicals which need to come in and, and help make this gene make a protein can't get, you know, if, you're, if your chromosomes are all wound up tightly, you can't then make other proteins. So actually the, the fact of having alteration in one of your KMT2A genes means that it probably affects the manufacture of other proteins. And that's what causes most likely the features of vitamin sinus syndrome. So, and Hans talks about this too. So, what is a de novo alteration or mutation? Um, and so, I guess the, it's a bit confusing in the literature because various terms have been used. And I think I think they essentially all mean variant or change in the DNA. And I think I think I guess the important thing is to remember that if, if we if someone looked at everyone's DNA and genes, everyone's got thousands of variants from the reference sequence. So there's lots of variation, and that's normal. So if, 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 if I sequenced all of my um, all of my genes, there'd be about 20,000 variants from the reference. Um, and the hard thing is working out when you sequence someone's DNA is what variants actually cause their disorder and which ones are simply the normal variation we see in life. Um, and so but what we do know is that everyone has changes compared to their parents. So we know that um, when the egg or the sperm is made, obviously there's lots of copying. So you have to copy your DNA every time you make a new cell. And sometimes that, sometimes you make mistakes. And so every time, you know, if everyone compared to their parents will have de novo alterations or de novo variants. Um, and they obviously can occur in any of the genes. They can also occur in between the genes. 
And so actually, you know, most of the time, your 100 or so new changes don't, don't cause any effects at all. Um, however, if your change occurs in a, pro in a gene that encodes an important protein, that is what will then, ca then cause an individual to have Friedman and Steiner syndrome. So these um, de novo um, changes in, in our genes um, these occur by chance. As Han said, it's nobody's fault. It's nothing that was done in pregnancy um, or anything like that. Or, you know, it's just something that happens when we're making egg or sperm cells. Um, and so, but this is the most common situation in, with individuals with Biedemann Steiner syndrome. Um, and um, what we would normally um, discuss with parents is if we, if, we, if we test parents and they don't carry it, there will be a low chance of having a future child with Biedemann Steiner syndrome of up to 1%. Um, but um, we do have one of our families where one of the parents has a very low level of the gene alteration. So, so we, we couldn't say it's that low unless we tested both, we tested both parents. So yeah, just, that's just sort of reiterating what I've just said. So a couple who have a child with a KMT2A alteration of Edelman's spinal syndrome, but who did not, who don't carry the alteration themselves, have a low chance of having a further child with Edelman's spinal syndrome. So if a person has um, Wiedemann Steiner syndrome themselves, um, the chance of passing it on to each of their children would be 1 in 2 or 50%. Um, and that obviously is because in each of their cells, one of the KMT2A gene alterations, one of the KMT2A genes has an alteration in it. Um, and so, so this is something that people are concerned about. That's something the genetics clinic will be able to, to chat through in terms of options for pregnancy and that kind of thing. So I'm now going to come on to, um, so I guess, results from research. So thank you everyone who's taken part in the research that I've been carrying out into Vedemann's spinal syndrome. I thought I'd, sort of, I guess, start by, this is a paper with, with was a very in process, final process of putting together and submitting for publication. Um, but I thought what I'd kind of highlight here is that lots and lots of clinicians have been involved in this paper, in this paper. Um, a number in this room, including hands on the floor, um, but also clinicians across the world. Um, and so I think, I, I guess it's important to highlight that I couldn't do this without all these other doctors and many of them have sort of helped welcome me into their clinics and across Europe um, and obviously in Baltimore a couple of years ago. Um, but, you know, I've also been very kind in terms of um, helping me come and visit them and see individuals with Biedem and Steiner syndrome. And so this paper hopefully will be out soon, so you'll be able to, you'll be able to, um, to read it. Um, and I thought what I would do is just help to explain some of the science so when you do read it, it perhaps doesn't um, bezel you as much as it might have done. Um, so so, um, so what, we're, what we call in the paper is a genetic and phenotypic study of 87 individuals with even Steiner syndrome and um, resulted in KMT2A mutations. So I guess we're looking at the genetics. So there's been a few questions about the types of alterations or mutations in genes. So we're, we're looking at those. There's a detailed study of the different mutations and what that might mean. Um, and also phenotypic, so we use the word phenotype, essentially just means the features somebody has, so the, the difficulties they've had or, or that kind of thing. So it's a, essentially it's a study of the genetics, so what the underlying KMT2A change, um, and also the, the features individuals have. So what we did, um, we, I, I put together a questionnaire, and this was iterative, so um, the initial individuals I saw with Vedem and Steiner syndrome had a much shorter questionnaire, um, and, then, and then I realised from families actually children have these difficulties too, so actually we should ask about these. And I think one of the biggest learning points actually was that many individuals who I saw who had been seen by a geneticist for a long time, um, they saw they've got these difficulties. And then, then actually when I went to see them in clinic and started asking more detail about sleep and behaviour, is actually they had a lot more difficulties than the original doctor had realised. And so I think it was really um, helpful to go back and say, actually, do you have these ones or do you have this or do you have that? Um, so in the end, it was quite a long questionnaire. Um, of all the difficulties that an individual might have. Um, and so, um, so uh, yeah, so I think one big part of this paper is talking about the different alterations that people have. Um, and so I guess essentially the alterations in the KMT2A gene are different types. Um, and so one type is a nonsense mutation or a stop mutation. And that essentially means that when the protein's being made, so the gene gives the body instructions to make the protein, that the protein stops being made halfway through. And so what often happens in that situation, we think, is that when the protein's made, only half of it's made, it's then broken down. So that the half-made protein is then broken down by the body, and you only have half the load of that protein that you should have. Um, so the frame shift alterations and the nonsense or stop alterations, that's, we think, the mechanism of action. 
Um, and another mechanism is, is missense, and that essentially means that you don't produce the protein with the same amino acids in the same place as, as usual. Um, and these types of alterations are a bit harder to interpret. So we have families where they have a, a missense or this type of change where there's a change in amino acid that started for the first time in an individual, and we don't think they have beaded in in some instances. So I think it's really, really important um, when finding changes in this gene that actually we're, you know, the clinical geneticist is give, you know, has a long time thinking about actually does this fit? Because with some alterations, um, we have to be careful that we're not misinterpreting them. Um, and so what I did with um, the 27 individuals in the study um, was had a, uh, had a very careful look at these alterations. And this is a bit of a complicated diagram, um, and so don't worry if you don't completely get it. But I'll just, I'll just, just that the principles of this are, this is a cartoon um, of what the protein looks like. So the proteins are quite complicated. In fact, I think I've got more pictures. So proteins are kind of, they're 3D structures that fold up, and they've got different domains. <laughs> yeah, just trust me, because <laughs> it's a bit complicated. Um, so that they're really complicated. But if you made it simple, and, and showed it wasn't showed it not folding. This is sort of showing from the top is the beginning of the protein, and then it kind of it's so long I couldn't really easily put it on, so we sort of cut it up. But it's a, you know it can it's a very long structure, and within the protein there's different areas which we call domains, and and we don't necessarily know everything about all proteins, but we know that certain parts of the protein could do certain things because they're like other parts of similar proteins or different proteins. Um, but what we can do is say, actually, this, this bit of the gene it causes a protein with a change here. So what, this is what this diagram is saying. So it's saying this is the protein, this is, what it, this is kind of a cartoon of what it looks like. Um, and what we know, so remember I talked about how we all have these variants compared to the reference sequence. Um, and we know from looking at a database that actually in the general healthy population that there's changes in the KMT2A gene. So we talked about these missense changes, so changes where the amino acid changes in the protein. Um, we know that in the background population, these green balls are actually healthy individuals with changes in this gene. So it's important to know about the fact that you can have changes in this gene and be completely healthy. And so we, we've plotted these out to show actually, you know, we've got to be careful. We know there's background variation, which is normal. Um, and, and then what we've done is gone through and looked at the different types of alteration that, that individuals with Venom and Steiner have um, and showed where they fall in the protein. And you can see that um, a number of them cluster, so a number of individuals actually have the same alteration. Um, and so there's what we call recurrent gene alterations. Um, and we, we also know that looking at these missense variants I talked about, so the ones that are difficult to interpret, um, are the red and the blue balls. And you can see that these often cluster around important parts of the protein. So these thicker bits are at sort of important domains of the protein. And so actually what we've done by modeling this is to say, actually, if you're an individual where there's a missense change, what you perhaps would be helpful to do is look at where it falls because actually they're clustering around important parts of the protein. And that's, and then I'll come on to that in a little bit of time. Um, and so this is um, some, some work we did, done by one of my colleagues, Roman Lewazowski, at the European Bioinformatics Institute. And so what he's been doing is looking at where these missense or these changes fall in the protein. Um, and I guess probably to, all, all you really need to understand here is that the KMT2A protein, so this enzyme which catalyzes this reaction, actually binds to the DNA itself. So in order to catalyze the reaction, it has, has a, a way of binding to the DNA. And what we think is happening is actually that um, the people who've got a missense alteration, it's changing the structure. So there's a very sort of, a, sort of a complex structure here um, with the amino acid residue called cysteines, and disrupting these cysteine residues probably stops it binding to DNA. And if it can't bind to DNA, it probably can't do its job properly, which is to catalyze this reaction. Um, and so I guess in summary, we think we found a, me a mechanism as to how some individuals and have Biedemann Steiner syndrome when they have a change which doesn't stop the protein being made, but in fact a protein that's made which doesn't work properly and um, because it can't bind to the DNA and then it can't do the job it needs to do. Okay, so um, that I guess is the kind of the genetic side of it. So we've looked across all the gene alterations and done a study of what, what kind of changes people have. Um, and I think before going on to this, um, I sort of had a question, so do individuals with certain changes have more severe features than other children or do they have certain problems more than other problems um, and actually there wasn't any significant difference between the features people had you had whether they had a frame shift or a loss of function or a, 
or a missense variant. Um, there was one recurrent mutation where all of the individuals had epilepsy. Um, but I think we're still probably not at the right stage where we can say that's a definite association, but that's something we can sort of look more at in the future. But we certainly went through a lot of the, the more commoner features and didn't find a particular link between um, the features you had and the type of um, gene alteration you, you had. Um, and so what I'm going to do is go through some of the features that came up um, and through the study of these individuals. Um, I'm conscious I'm speaking to the experts <laughs> in Gila and Spina syndrome, so I'm sure many of you through reading the Facebook group will also be aware of, sort of the commonest features of Gila and Spina syndrome. Um, and so this, this paper will obviously be published, um, and what I always sort of say, say to my um, patients when there's a, there's a paper where there's lots of information is that, you know, take it with you, keep it in your bag, if you ever need to go to an emergency or anything, take this with you. Um, and what we're also hoping to do is to, to write a nice set of guidelines so that at every stage of life you know what tests the children should have or what to look out for. And I don't know if any of you have seen on the Kabuki, Kabuki syndrome, we've got some guidelines made by DISCERN, which is a sort of a, um, an organisation in Manchester. Um, it's quite a big booklet, and we're, we're going to model sort of the leading and spinal advice based on that. So I'm just sorry it's taken a while, but we have to do the groundwork, which is to see all the families first before we know what to recommend. Um, so I guess the commonest features are increased body hair. So 82% of individuals had increased body hair. Um, and feeding problems, 75% of individuals. And actually 17% of individuals had a PEG or PEJ or um, a G-tube, I think you call it in the US. Um, um, in, in an early life. Um, constipation, also around half of individuals had constipation. Hypertonia, as Hans has mentioned, um, 44%, um, and reflux, 21% of individuals. So 17% of individuals had seizures, um, and I think if looking at the individuals who had epilepsy who had seizures, there was, there was sort of a correlation between, um, I guess, development not being as good or in individuals with seizures, but again, we need more numbers to, to look into this a little bit more. Um, and then structural heart or kidney abnormality. So 16% of individuals had a structural heart abnormality um, and 10% of structural renal abnormality. So these are things that the children were born with. And actually, if they've had a normal scan, that you know, we wouldn't expect these to happen later. These are things that you're born with and you either have or you haven't. Um, looking at young women, 11% um, had menstrual abnormalities. Um, and then another feature that we saw in a number of individuals was an increased frequency of infections. Um, and this is sort of multifactorial, so there's probably a number of reasons why children get increased infections. Um, but there are, um, not in the individuals I study, but in looking at the literature, there are some individuals who have had quite significant immune problems. And so that's why we have some recommendations about testing for this. But in a large majority of children, um, it's really just sort of a tendency to have um, kind of more upper respiratory tract infections, um, but we do need to make sure that there's nothing more serious going on because there have been some individuals with more significant difficulties. Um, so eyes and ears, so eyes, um, lots of different eye abnormalities, so a number of individuals wore glasses, but for different reasons. Um, so seven individuals were long-sighted, ten were short-sighted, a number of individuals had a squint, um, and also actually, it's not mentioned here, but a number of individuals had ptosis, so where one of the eyelids is a little bit more droopy. Um, so ear problems were quite common, so um, a number of individuals had narrow ear canals um, and had problems with otitis media, so ear infections, a num number of individuals had had vomits um, and things like that. Um, and so in terms of delay, I haven't, I haven't put all the milestones here, but they'll be in the paper. Um, and so I think that the large majority across the whole cohort um, had mild, moderate or mild to moderate difficulties. Um, so either development of delay or, or learning difficulties or intellectual disability. Um, and 12% 12, 12 of individuals had moderate to severe difficulties um, and with only 3% of individuals having profound difficulties. Um, and I guess at the bottom there, so there's two individuals in this cohort of 87 with normal learning. Um, one is a gentleman who um, was in his 60s um, and he's a little bit um, unusual in that he has so the KMT2 gene alteration probably started sometime after he started being developing. So probably say when he was three or four weeks old as a, as a developing embryo, the, the gene alteration started then. So actually it didn't, it wasn't in every single one of his cells, it was only in some of them. Um, and so he had, he has, he had short stature um, and very other, very few other features. 
Um, so he, but he had normal learning. So there's one um, gentleman who was in his 60s, I think, with normal learning, um, and there's an there's an eight-year-old girl who has um, normal learning um, at this stage. Um, and so this is slightly tricky because schooling is slightly different across the world. I learned through this, um, but, <laughs> um, but to give a rough guide. Um, 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 looking at whether people are at regular school or whether they're in a mainstream, in England we call mainstream, I think this is regular school here. Um, and I also think what's different as well is sometimes school, some countries hold people back a year and that kind of thing, which we don't do in the UK. So it's a little bit different across the world, but just to give you sort of a general idea of the individuals. So 10 individuals are at a mainstream or regular school, um, and then an additional nine individuals were at a regular school with a bit of extra help. Um, 44 individuals were at a special needs school or have been at a special needs school. Um, and then we didn't unfortunately have the data for a further 24 individuals or they've been sort of homeschooled so it's difficult to sort of assess their level. So and I think again, again, again you're going to be the experts in this and we're hoping to do a much more detailed assessment um, of learning and the particular strengths of learning. Um, but often um, language skills are often highlighted as a strength that ch children have delay in, in all areas but actually um, compared to other individuals with developmental disorders that language was highlighted as, as a strength. Um, and, and reading, a number of a number of families said actually their reading age is very good, or you know some individuals' reading age is actually quite advanced, um, and actually advanced beyond their understanding. So they're able, many children and that were able to read quite advanced texts, but had difficulty understanding what what they were actually reading. Um, and mathematics was something that was highlighted as difficult for a number of children. So um, perhaps later when we talk about sort of behaviour and learning, we might be able to talk about that a little bit more. But this is this is not a formal assessment. So I think we're going to use this information to go on and work with psychologists to kind of look more at learning and to help kind of help guide um, everyone's future. So I think um, obviously lots of people ask about adult outcomes, and um, it was brilliant to have some adults in the study who very kindly took part. Um, but the numbers are small, and I think I think you know I think it's quite difficult in terms of ascertainment with adults, but maybe they're seen by clinicians because they have ongoing difficulties um, and so it, it's, it's difficult really but we're, we're working on this to try and increase the number of adults that we um, that we have information on um, and I think it's as Hans mentioned very difficult to predict the future but generally our best guide is you know, how a child's doing now and and also the fact that now we know a child has a freedom of stylus in general we know what we can do to help to um, help them fulfill their potential and so we've got 11 individuals in, in this study over 18 years old um, and two of those individuals work in a mainstream environment, so they, they, they work in an environment where they're not supported in any way. Um, and um, three individuals, yeah, so two individuals work in a sheltered environment, so they go to work, but it's not a, it's a regular workplace, um, and they get a bit more support than you would do normally. Um, and three individuals live in sheltered living accommodation with minimal support, so they're sort of living, living independently, but with a bit of support with, with certain things. And, and some themes that came up were sort of difficulty managing money or and sort of more sort of complex things. So, so that's the data we have. I mean, hopefully there'll be more information available in the future. Um, and so I thought I'd draw quite a lot of attention to this because this is something that I was quite struck by from an early stage, um, is that life's very hard for many families and behaviour is a really considerable um, part of um, being in the science for many families. Not all families. Um, so there were families I, who I met who didn't have concerns about behaviour or and families where the children were very friendly and were worried about the children being too friendly, but they didn't have any other concerns. But I think I think this is certainly an area that we want to work, you know, work with other people to work on because this this is what causes distress to families. So 70% 70, 70 of individuals had difficulty with behaviour, um, and of those, and so we, we again, this I'm not a sort of a behavioural expert, but this is this is the themes that came out of the conversations I've had with families. So 21% 20, of children had abnormal fear or anxiety related behaviour um, and 21% had, had been diagnosed with autism or had autistic behaviour um, and actually a, so also 8% if you look further down there um, had, had difficulties with routines in addition to the children that had um, a diagnosis of autism or, or features of autism. 18% um, of individuals had demonstrated aggressive behaviour, 13% um, had been diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder um, and at the bottom there, 10% of individuals had um, behaviour where they sort of injured themselves or banged their head or, or that kind of thing. So I think this was sub certainly something that came out quite a lot of, from seeing, seeing families and recognising that this, this, you know, this is where families need support and this is where we need to do research. 
Um, so another, another fact that I was quite struck by in clinic was sleep is a problem for many families, and this came out of the, the, the registry data as well. Um, and so 34 individuals out of 87 had sleep disturbance. It's probably more than this, actually, because sometimes the data didn't come back from clinicians about sleep. They maybe hadn't asked about it. I think it's like to be higher than this, actually. Um, and there is some increasing evidence that people have looked at that these um, chrome can be modeling events, so these events where we get our DNA to open up or close down, and probably have a role in, in Caucasian regulation. So Caucasian regulation is essentially when your body's being told to be awake or be asleep. Um, so likewise, when you're jet lagged, your body's telling you the wrong things. It's saying sleep when it's five o'clock in the afternoon, or it's saying be awake at two in the morning. So I think we think that these events, which tell your body be awake, be asleep, are potentially disturbed in individuals with eating sinus. So their body's giving them the wrong cues. Like it's, at, you know, at bedtime, it's not really bedtime for them. It's, it's in the middle of the day. So we think that's probably what's happening. Um, but there isn't, there isn't evidence yet of that in reading the sign of it. We think that's the possibility. Um, but I think also, I think what we were struck by is that children have a number of other difficulties that could affect sleep as well. So, um, <laughs> so um, reflux and tendencies to having ear infections and there are other infections um, or behavioural difficulties. But this is something also that really kind of came up as, as being a, a difficulty for many families. I think the other thing actually was a number of families said that melatonin helped or didn't help or there were a number of medications for sleep. I think that's something that we're, we're in the future going to look at um, and thinking about trialing medications that are used generally in, in terms of sleep and finding out what actually helps. Um, and so there's a number of other features. I haven't mentioned everything here, but everything will be in the paper. Um, and 26% of individuals had sort of reported to have swollen feet or um, large, sort of, I guess, increased um, increased thickness of the hands and feet, and we don't know why this is. Um, there are some disorders that can result in these features, um, but a number of individuals mentioned that this has changed with time, um, so if that's sort of something we, we don't know the cause for that. 31% um, of individuals had advanced eruption of teeth, so this essentially means that teeth come out early or teeth are lost early, and this is, re this is really quite common. Um, and 39% of individuals had abnormality of the pain sensation, so Things that would normally be painful to everyone else didn't seem to be as painful um, for in individuals with Beedon Steiner syndrome. Um, and I think um, other, other, other fe features of Beedon Steiner syndrome, which I guess are becoming more known about, are fused cervical vertebrae. So that means the bones at the back, um, instead of being separate, um, are joined together in a small number of individuals with Beedon Steiner syndrome. Um, and that's not something, if your doctor's not noticed any abnormalities of the neck, the neck or back, that's not something you'd need to worry about. Um, but that's something that doctors need to know about when assessing children to make sure that um, some children would need x-rays. So, so it's important to know about. Um, and another um, difficulty that some small number of individuals have is sleep apnea. So this is where um, you have difficulties um, with, with, with breathing and getting the right amount of oxygen, oxygen in it when you're sleeping and this, this affects a small number of children but it is really important to bear this in mind particularly when thinking about growth hormone because it is seen in individuals um, with Beedon and Steiner syndrome. Um, and so this is um, some data about growth um, and this will guide um, the growth chart that we're hoping to put together for Beedon and Steiner syndrome. Um, and so this is weight. So um, these we see these charts all the time but I'm sure you haven't seen them before so I'm just going to describe what they are to you. So Along the side is weight, so this is birth weight in boys, this is birth weight in girls, and then along the bottom is gestation, so that's 40 weeks, that's term, so, and that's obviously for, for babies that are born earlier than term, so again that's term, 40 weeks, and that's for babies that were born earlier. Um, and this is, this is the mean, and then this red line underneath is the minus two standard deviation, so this would be a lo you know, low birth weight is below here. And again, this is mean plus two standard deviations. So again, that's that we've got an abnormally large birth weight. Um, and so actually, if you look at birth weights, these these are sort of, oops, carried away there. Um, these are <laughs> these are really kind of in the normal range. So babies, you know, some were some babies that are outside the normal range, but I don't think from looking at those you could think there'd be anything different about the babies that were, were born with Beedon Steiner syndrome. However, when you look at um, when you look at life, so again, this is weight. So there's weight in life now, and weight in life, and this is boys, and this is girls, um, and this is ages. Um, so we don't have we don't have good weights over the age of 25. So 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 this is just in, in life up to the age of around 20. Um, and you can see, and perhaps you should have zoomed in, which we are real on the paper, is actually birth at weight after birth is definitely in the lower end of things. Um, um, but then as time goes on, then it's more scattered within the normal range. And um, so this is this is males. Um, 
and then this is females. Actually, this hasn't projected very well, but actually there are some individuals here above the, um, the range for weight in, in the female group. So I think that probably warrants a little bit more investigation in terms of um, later on in life for women, but we don't have much data at the moment for adults. So I think essentially, I guess the conclusion from this is though birth weight seems to be in the normal range, um, when, when children are born and have difficulties with feeding, then weight becomes, becomes a problem. Um, and again, all oh, unfortunately, this not projected very well either, but this is just to show you, um, so this is height. Um, so again, with this, these data are going to be used to help generate the growth chart. Um, and I guess what, what you can see or maybe not see very well in this projection is actually there's very few individuals who are in the top half of things. So very few individuals in the top half of the normal range. And um, there are some individuals who are underneath. So this red line again is the kind of minus two standard deviation. So this is the bottom of the normal range. So there are individuals who are below this. Um, but actually individuals we looked at later on in life are in sort of the lower half generally of the normal range. Um, that's for males. And then for females, there, is, there are more individuals that are underneath that curve. Um, but you can see that there is a dis distribution. Um, and so you probably when we plot our curves for growth, that they're not going to include you know, that that the range is going to be is going to be going to be lower, um, but there are you know a number of individuals here who are within that normal range, um, and this is again is head circumference, um, so you can see that many of the values are below the normal range or just in the bottom half of the normal range. That's for males and that's for females. So I think what we're going to do is use these data and uh, work with FLIR to to generate growth charts so that actually they can say actually that's within the range for for the Steiner syndrome. Um, so, yeah, so what research is going on in the UK? So my thesis is now published. So the first publication from all the work that you've um, very kindly, many of you have taken part in, has now been published. It's, not, it's quite hard to find, but what I might do is just send a PDF to Libby so she can, she can share it. And so um, that's got some of the clinical data in it. There'll be more, the paper will have more guidelines about management. So this is, this is more sort of a scientific publication of sort of a general overview. Um, but a number of those figures, the percentage of children who've had this, and that will be there too. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so PhDs can be, this is, this is in Cambridge, everyone takes a picture by this red door when you submit your PhD, and so that's my red door picture. <laughs> um, and, um, and so what I'm doing, so I, I've just been taken on as, as a permanent member of staff at Great Ormond Street Hospital in London, and I'm um, continuing to study Vedum and Steiner, so this is the Vedum and Steiner and hypertrichosis. So hypertrichosis is, is increased body hair, um, and so that's, I guess, how we initially started studying individuals with Vedum and Steiner syndrome, it was the increased hair that can cause you to put them together. Um, and so I've um, got full ethics and have just set up this, this study to go on further. Um, and actually what we've been um, put together a research proposal to study IPS cells or stem cells. So um, one way of studying disorders is by saying actually probably some of the changes that cause this disorder start before an individual is born. So when the cells are at a very early stage and very early in life, cells don't know which cell they are yet. They could go on to become a, a nerve cell or a you know, a blood cell or a skeletal muscle cell. Um, but if you go early on and look at the cells before they've decided what they are yet, then you can model disorders. So we could grow cells and tell them to go back to being a cell that doesn't know what it is yet, and then, then make nerve cells from individuals with Edelman Steiner syndrome and see well what happens in nerves when when these children are, you know, uh, when in, you know during pregnancy when these children are developing as embryos or fetuses, what's happening and and, and how does this cause Edelman Steiner syndrome? Um, so this is one part of the study. And then working with a number of different people. So this is Helena Kilpinen. So she's a researcher at University College in London. Um, and she's an expert looking at the data from individuals with um, we're looking at stem cell data or data from these cells. And so um, some families are very kindly going to give samples so we can generate these stem cells. Um, and uh, uh, Helena's going to look at them and look at the changes in these cells um, and you know, just to help you know, hopefully look at what targets we could develop for treatment. Um, and there's another gentleman, Albert Basson, who um, is at King's College in London. Um, and he's, he approached me recently because he's very interested in behavior. Um, and he saw there were some similarities with genes that he, with KMT2A and genes that he's interested in that are involved in autism. And so he's, he's contacted me and saying, I'm going to do some mouse work and I'm going to do some other things and let's work together because um, I'm very interested in behavior. So these are two of my collaborators in London at the moment. And then finally, so I did my PhD at the Sanger Institute, which is based in Cambridge, um, and three of my colleagues I've managed um, to interest in working with Wiedemann and Steiner syndrome. So Matt Hurls on the left is a very eminent research scientist at, at the Sanger Institute, and he um, is generating lots of mice. So as Hans kept mentioning, there's lots of disorders that are similar to Wiedemann and Steiner syndrome that involve these genes that affect the structure of DNA. And so he's made mice for all of these. 
um, disorders, but he started with KMT2A because he knew that was what I was interested in. Um, and so there are mice in Cambridge who have the hair freedom and sinus syndrome. Um, and so I'm working with Sebastian and Gabby to try and um, say, tell them what the features are in, in humans and see whether they're similar in mice. And so they've designed a number of experiments to try and work out what difficulties the mice have and how sociable they are. Um, they have sort of a, an environment for mice where they can live. It's like a mouse city. <laughs> and in the mouse city, there's rooms where there's light and there's rooms where there's food and there's rooms where there's other mice. And they can they basically film these mice and they work out how sociable they are, whether they like certain conditions, um, and what you know, what they don't like, how much they sleep, whether they sleep at day. I mean, mice generally sleep during the day and awake at night, but maybe you know, the mice sleep at different times. And so I've had a long conversation with them, saying, well, this is the problems the families have, and this happens. And so they've designed lots of experiments to try and work out what problems the mice have. Um, and the reason for that is obviously if you know that the mice have similar problems to to the children or adults, it means that we can think about treatments and we can try potential treatments on mice and see whether whether you know we can treat we can treat mice. So there's lots going on in the UK, um, and um, you know we're going to continue to study freedom and sinus syndrome. Um, but I just want to thank everyone who's taken part in research and thanks everyone for coming today.